During the next night, the following day and the second night, no one, not even his own mother or the women who saw him buried, seems to have gone to the grave of Jesus. Here's the Son of God! And this is what they're supposed to have done for Mosaic law. In Deuteronomy 21, verse 22 and 23, that's Mosaic law. Expressly requires that anyone hanged from a tree must be buried the same day. Deuteronomy 21, 21 and 22. No, 22 and 23, sorry. Now, all the miracles of Jesus didn't seem to make any significant impression on the spectators. Enough for them to take him or to take any action at the time they were giving his trial. Not even his apostles, who repeatedly pledged their belief in his divinity and his mission, cause uh, at his arrest came to him. All forsook him and fled. And you could read that in Matthew 26 and 56, read that in Mark 14 and 50. These bastards didn't even attend his funeral and his burial. All those miracles supposed to have occurred within a year or two before the crucifixion. These miracles, the Bible say, were so famous that the news had gone forth into all the land. Read Matthew 9 and 25. Read Luke 7 and 17. Throughout all of Syria, read Matthew 4 and 24. Luke 7 and 17 says that even the wonders of his birth were known abroad. And again in Luke 2 and 49, we are told a chorus, a curious and isolated story of a young Jesus. Now check this in Luke 2 and 49. Positively astonishing the Sanhedrin with his precocious wisdom. A little 12-year-old over there speaking universal terms. The whole priesthood should have known about this. But only Luke talks about this 12-year-old. Nobody knows about Jesus from the time he was born and all these miracles about God saying, this is my son. After the 12th year in the temple when Mary had to go looking for him, he disappears until he's 33. Where the hell was he? Now you see, why I'm saying this is because you want me to believe that God came down in the form of a man and did things with men. So if he did things with men, that means he would be regimented to the laws of cause and effect. He would be regimented to the things of man. So he had to eat, sleep, shit, and do something with somebody so he had been seen. But nobody knows where this man went until he's 33 years old. Then he pops up for a year or two and they kill this asshole. <laughs> Can we, but wait a minute, let me get down because we're going to get into all that. I got a lot to, to read to you. Now, what about Lazarus? He brought this rotting, festering, maggot eaten carcass back to life in front of witnesses. It seems that only John had the courage to write about it. This is John 11 39 and 44. This miracle took place in Beth Ani, only about two miles away and only a short time before the crucifixion. We are told by the Bible that it was known to much people, and this miracle had led many to believe on him. Read John 12, 9 through 11. Yet even with this incredible and stupendous event known to the many, it wasn't enough to cause anyone, not even an ungrateful Lazarus himself, to show up at the trial. You would think that a corpse rotting in there, he'd show up. Damn! Now here's your boy arrested and nobody's going down to check him out. Again, where were the blind who he had made to see? Where were the lame he had made to walk? Where were the exorcised from which he threw out the demons? Where were the thousands? Check this! Where were the 5,000 hungry 
no good motherfuckers that he fed. <laughs> Five thousand on some bread and fish. <laughs> Two loaves of Five fishes. <laughs> Where were these invisible bread and fish? Second Kings 4 and 42 to 44. You read about that there. The same multitude of people he ran from when he saw that they were about to make him a king. Remember in John 6 and 15, they were all coming to make him a goddamn king. Where were all of them? Many of these same people must have been at the Passover in Jerusalem. However, the Greek translator of John mistakenly wrote that it was celebrated on Lake Galilee, John 6, 1 through 4, but which was always brought multitudes to the Jerusalem. Another contradiction states that the disciples were arrested for filling Jerusalem with assertions that Jesus had risen from the dead after he had been condemned and executed, as well as for saying that he was the Christ. Jesus himself told them to tell no one who he was, for he himself never made such claims. Remember, he asked him, who you are, who you think I am? He ain't never said, I am the Christ. You read it in Matthew 26, 63 to 66. Yet in his case, this claims, these claims made him worthy of death. He never, ever said he was the Christ. However, on behalf of the disciples arrested, check this out. On behalf of the disciples, they arrested the disciples. The wisest of all the Jews, a man named Gamaliel, spoke gems of counsel, which on the outstretched finger of time should sparkle forever. And he won because these apostles were only beaten and discharged. Acts 5, 33 to 42. If, this wise Gamaliel came out to defend these low-life punk apostles who deserted Jesus for now declaring that he was the same Jesus raised up from the dead and was still alive. Where the hell was Gamaliel to defend Jesus at his trial? The trial and execution of Jesus was not secretive and hasty. It was overt and deliberate. The Bible says a great multitude in Matthew 26 and 47, Mark 14 and 43, Luke 22 and 47, called it a multitude that witnessed his arrest. And the chief priests and elders and all the councils in Matthew 26 and 59 sat together at his trial. Matthew 27, 20, 24, Luke 23 and 13, Mark 15 and 8 says that a multitude was present when he was examined by Pilate. And Luke 23 and 27 states a great multitude of people and all of his acquaintances, Luke 23 and 49, were at his place of execution. Furthermore, all the people were willing for, for calling for the blood of Jesus to be on their, uh, to be on their heads, Matthew 27, 22, 23 and 25. This viciousness and rage by the people is difficult to comprehend in light of the fact of who he was and what he did for them. Any jackass who sees a man raise the dead, give sight to the blind, give mobility to the lame, walk on water and feed 5,000 people with a couple of fish and bread would think that you couldn't hurt a man with a whip or threaten him with death. He'd just raise up and kill you all. <laughs> The raising back to life of a dead, festering corpse was not your everyday occurrence, even in this alleged time of wonders and miracles. Neither was healing someone blind from birth, that's in John 10 and 32. Or was it usual for a star to suddenly move its position through the sky and literally pause over the cradle of a child? That's Matthew 2 and 9. Neither was it common for a voice, a fucking voice out of heaven coming down and saying, This is my son! Matthew 3 and 17, Mark 1 and 11, Luke 3 and 22. There are three special features in the crucifixion story that intelligent, free-thinking people should observe. One, neither the signs, miracles, or wonders that happened on his behalf 
or the extraordinary happenings surrounding his death, his baptism, or his recognition by a voice from heaven that he was the son of God. None of these extraordinary events were so much as mentioned at his trial. No one raised a voice in his defense, not even one of those but a short time before who was laying in a grave, not even those who wanted to make him king, nor those he had just healed. Three, the crucifixion is nowhere referred to in the New Testament outside of the four Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. Why is that? In the first four epistles of Paul, believed to be the genuine, the verb crucified appears in ten different texts. Romans 6 and 6, know this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. In Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 1 and 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Listen to the way they use the word. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 23, but we preached Christ sat crucified. Listen to this, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. In other words, they didn't believe that shit. 1 Corinthians 2 and 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 2 and 8, For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of, the Lord of glory. 2 Corinthians 13 and 4, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. Galatians 2 and 20, I am crucified with Christ. Galatians 3 and 1, O foolishness Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth before the, whose eyes Jesus Christ has seen evidence set before, crucified amongst you. Galatians 5 and 24, And they that are Christ's, have crucified the flesh with affections and lust. Galatians 6 and 14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, for him for whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Now, Webster's Dictionary defines the word crucified and crucify as follows. Crucify, A, to nail to the cross, to put to death by nailing the hands, the feet to a cross or giblet, sometimes um, anciently by fastening a criminal to a tree with cords. B, in scripture to subdue, to mortify. See how they use the word crucify? To destroy the power or ruling influence of. To reject, to despise, to vex, to torture. Now, the first definition is only on denoting physical um, execution. That's the only one which it is claimed that Christ suffered. But the word crucified as used by Paul clearly denotes, it's must, in most cases, a subduing or controlling of passions and carnal pleasures of the flesh. The, excerpts, the exceptions to this, when taken in connection with Paul's well-known teachings and allowing for the interpolations and forgeries of the early church fathers, they do not confirm the gospel accounts of any crucifixion of Jesus. In fact, in the 18 books of the New Testament which follows, the word crucify, crucified, appears only twice in Hebrews 6 and 6 and again in Revelations 11 and 8. The word crucifixion does not appear once in the entire Bible. Paul admitted himself that he did not witness the alleged crucifixion of Jesus. Now he was living there at the time, and everybody's supposed to have come out. It is further admitted that church scholars, uh, by church scholars, that his epistles, even if authentic, were, written, were not written until a whole generation after the crucifixion is said to have occurred. On pages 55 and 56 of his book, Did Jesus Really Live?, Marshall Gauvin writes, on the theory that Christ was crucified, how shall we explain the fact that during the first eight centuries of the evolution of Christianity, Christian art and Christian artifacts represented a lamb and not a man crucified on the cross and suffering on the cross, the cross for salvation of the world. Neither the paintings <clears throat> deep in the catacombs nor in the sepulchres on the old Christian tombs pictured a human figure on the cross. Everywhere a lamb is shown as the Christian symbol. 
And this is in Exodus 12 and 3. A lamb carrying the cross. A lamb at the foot of the cross. A lamb on the cross. These figures showed the lamb with a human head, shoulders and arms, holding a cross in its hands. The lamb of God, John 1 and 29, in the process of evolution into human form. The crucifixion myth made realistic. At the close of the 8th century, Pope Hadrian I, H-A-D-R-I-A-N I, confirming a decree in the 6th Synod of Constantinople. Now, am I giving you facts or what? Pope Hadrian, H-A-D-R-I-A-N the first, confirming a decree of the sixth synod, S-Y-N-O-D, of the Constantinople, commanded that thereafter in the eighth century, the figure of a man should take the place of the lamb. Now all you good Christians who went to seminary, either you know that and you still took on the mantle of preaching, this bullshit, or you some dumbasses, and you go to seminary to become stupid. Cemetery. You put the cross in there, you're right. It took Christianity 800 years to develop the symbol of its suffering Savior. For 800 years, the Christ on the cross was a lamb. If Christ was really crucified, why was his place on the cross so long usurped by a lamb? In the light of history and reason, we have to think twice. Part two. Now in view of the lamb on the cross, why should we believe in the crucifixion? And let me ask, if Christ performed the miracles the New Testament describes, if he gave sight to the blind men's, to blind men's eyes, if his magic touched brought youthful vigor to a palsied frame, if the petrified dead in, 11, in John eleven thirty nine, 39, at his command was returned to life and love again, why did these same people want him crucified instead of an insurgent and murderer? And remember, it was give us Barabbas instead? It is not amazing that a civilized people, and, and for the Jews of that age, we don't, wanna, we don't wanna know what to call them, were supposed to have been civilized, were so filled with murderous hatred towards a kind and loving man who went about doing good, who preached forgiveness, cleansed the lepers, raised the dead, that they should now not be appeased until they sacrificed this benefactor to mankind. From the standpoint of history and the supposed facts, the account of the crucifixion of Christ is as impossible to believe as the raising of a corpse of Lazarus from the standpoint of nature. The simple truth is that the four Gospels are historically worthless. They abound in contradictions and are unreasonable, the miraculous and the monstrous. They are not a thing in, there is not a thing in them that can be depended upon as true, while there is much in them that can certainly be proved false. The doctrine of the crucifixion was already thousands of years old by the time Paul was known. And it was known from India to North, to North America, to Africa, to Rome. Every nation had its crucified God and the story of the resurrection. Paul's own statements showed that he desired which one, that he desired which one of the many crucified gods that he represented and what he wanted them to believe in. Now, let's take the crucifixion from two standpoints. Let's first take it from a legal standpoint. All right? Let's go to Rome during that time and see how things were done at that time. Strong doubt arises in the mind of intelligent people concerning the gospel truth about the crucifixion. When you examine the evidence that lies outside the church and its scriptures and use the scriptures simply as ancient documents, you find them convoluted and of no historical value. Two principal reasons make it difficult for intelligent people to believe in the crucifixion. One, the Jews at that time were a subjugated people. Rome subjugated them. Now, when they were subjugated, they did not administer the laws of their own country. They were, super, they were specifically deprived of jurisdiction over all capital offenses. This is history. All right? They had no power in Rome to have any trial and thus condemn anybody for a capital offense. 
How do I know this? Well, we will find out. Therefore, the Jews could not have crucified Jesus unless it was illegally done, as the spontaneous violent act of a mob, which occurred in the Gospels in the mob. And it was not. It was a protracted trial. The Romans would not have crucified Jesus for the offenses he was charged with. Check it. The infliction of capital punishment was relegated by law. And heresy to a foreign god was not punishable by death. Remember what he was crucified for. Contradiction. He was crucified for saying that he was the Christ. For saying that he was God. He's supposed to have committed heresy. Blasphemed. And that's what they condemned him for. That's not a capital offense. Listen carefully, people, because this is going to put to rest all of the myths and illusions. The circumstances surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus, as it was related in the Bible, were not in accordance with the customs and practices of either the Jews or the Romans. Actually, in several essential points, they were in direct violation of Roman law. Thus, it can easily be seen that the church fathers who compiled the Bible and interpolated the story had no knowledge of Roman history or Jewish traditions as they were at that time. Outside of the Bible account, there is no parallel or contemporaneous evidence that the crucifixion of Jesus actually took place. Author John E. Remsburg, John Remsburg, in his book, The Christ, page 24, gives a list of 42 different authors who lived and wrote during the alleged time of Christ, or within a century of that time. And yet, aside from two forged passages in the works of the Jew Josephus, and two historically disputed passages in the works of Roman writers, there is no other mention of Jesus himself, much less his cru crucifixion. Outside of the Gospels, not a word historically written near or on the reputed time of Jesus has come down to us, not even touches of the subjects of his life and his alleged crucifixion. According to historical researchers who have critically researched this matter, the Gospels themselves were not written until at least 150 years after the alleged life of Jesus. There is no evidence from any source that there existed before that time a man named Jesus Christ. Also, that they were composed by collecting floating reports and including a few fragments of, of reports of different writers that are now lost. The first Christian write, writings that mentioned Jesus the Christ were ascribed to a man named Clemens Romanos. And the date of the writings anywhere between 96 and 97 A.D. Some scholars refuse to recognize Clemens as the author of these works, saying that they did not appear until the second century. Regarding this, the Encyclopedia Britannica, the ninth edition, second volume, page 196, writes, A whole literature arose around the name of Clemens in subsequent times. Of this literature, the following portions have come down to us. One, a second epistle to the Corinthians found along with the first in the Codex, there's some, something called the Codex Alexandrinus. As far as we can judge from the writing itself, this work is rather a homily than a letter. In all probability, the author belonged to Egypt. Various superstitions or suppositions have, have been made as to its authorship, but none that commands the, assert, the assent of a considerable number of critics. It seems to have been written towards the middle or second end of the second century. The next to mention Jesus the Christ was Ignatius, whose epistles were written between 107 and 116 AD. Are you listen to me on this. Remember, I'm talking names that you could go back and find. Polycarp, Barnabas, Hermas, an unknown writer of the epistle to Di Di Diogentus, not Diognectus, Diognectus may have been written their relics before between 100 and 150 years after Jesus. Besides these, there are no other Christian or other writings referring to Jesus. That date earlier than the middle and the second century, except a few fragments of Quattro and Quadrato is the name of the man, and Aristo, 
written sometime between 117 and 138 AD. The first century of Christianity is a complete blackout historically. There is no known writings of the first hundred years of Christianity. We know nothing of what occurred for that hundred years time. From 1 AD to 100 AD, blank. We are three generations removed from Jesus before a single word appears about him. Outside the books of the New Testament and the, ne and the, and the, and the, man we, um, and the men who have examined them, the more lies and convoluted fables we find. All that have come down to us across the three generations has come by way of legend and unverified tradition. Few critical historians, even among Christians, give any real credit and, tradi and, and traditional accounts to the uh, disputed uh, points of history. Now, the Talmud said, 40 years before the destruction of our temple, the judgment of capital causes was taken away from Israel. Hello? 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the judgment of capital causes was taken away from Israel. It means the Jews had no power. This is a profound revelation of an historic reality. Reality because this means that only the Roman authorities could exercise lawful jurisdiction of capital offenses. But the Gospels assert that it was the Jews who tried, convicted, and sentenced Jesus in their own court. And this they did without consultation with or authority from the Romans. It was not until after they judged him worthy of death that they delivered him to Pilate or in any way sought due ratification for their actions. Even if the Jews did have the power to try Jesus for a capital offense, the trial was not in accordance with Jewish law. And Jewish authorities insist that it could not have happened in the way it was told in the Bible. The story goes that Jesus was taken for a preliminary examination before Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled in Matthew 26 and 57. That was illegal for Jewish law. This examination took place at night, which was also illegal. For in the work titled De Sindrius, chapter 1, volume 1, the Mishnah says that the capital trials are commenced only in the daytime and must also be concluded within that day. You want proof? He also writes that the law also provided that capital trials should not be held on the day of the Sabbath or a fasting day. The meeting of the council at which Jesus was finally condemned took place on a Friday morning, the day before the Sabbath, that is, the same day Jesus was alleged to have been crucified. Another point, Jesus was questioned in his own case, that is, he represented himself in propria persona. This is not permitted by Jewish law. With this law, in fact, a Jew could not even plead himself guilty. Maimonides, the Jewish scholar, writes, Our law condemns no one to death upon his own confession. Listen, I know it's tedious, but I'm dropping some pearls here so you can put the threads together to have the argument to show that Christianity is of no force. By law, the judge himself could not make any judicial use of the defendant's testimony. Another Jewish scholar historian named Bartimore writes, It is a fundamental principle with us, the Jew, that no one can damage himself by what he says in his own judgment. Now, taking the above into account, it seems that Matthew knows absolutely nothing about Jewish laws. He not only has the high priest questioning Jesus, but persisting in his own efforts to force him to testify. Read Matthew 26, 59 through 63. That's the judge telling him to testify, forcing him to testify. The gospel scribes seem to know diddly about court procedures. They make the judges into prosecutors and have the judges work up the evidence against him. They are represented as having determined in advance on the death of Jesus and then manufacturing the evidence to accomplish their design, condemning the prisoner before the trial began and suborning witnesses and subpoenaing witnesses for the purpose of giving the trial a legal aspect. Matthew says that the chief priests and, and the whole council sought false witness against Jesus, that they might put him to death. Matthew 26 and 59. 
But in the administration of Jewish law, the judge acts as an impartial advocate for the prisoner, like the judge advocate for the court martial, for a court martial. The judge is charged with preventing any undue influence from prevailing against the prisoner. Even if the judges were the most corrupt and capable of doing the most heinous things, the gospel alleges. It is not credible that they should have deemed to have done it safe so, because did they not tell you that they feared the multitude? No witnesses were allowed to testify for the defense. Yet at that time, Jewish law demanded the right of a vigorous defense. And this was scrupulously adhered to for the protection of the accused. So to condemn the, 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 the defendant Jesus right at the completion of the prosecutor's testimony? Before the defense had anything to say? The prosecutor said it, kill him. Even me and brother over here speaking law knows that you got you to get somebody, got to get a fair trial. Hey, you did all these miraculous things we got to try you for. Blasphemy was not punishable by death under Jewish law, yet that was the charge under which Jesus was condemned. Read Matthew 26, verse 65. But Jesus was not guilty of blasphemy according to Jewish law. The Mishnah states that blasphemy entails the mention of a divine name at the time, yod heh vor And that the accused is not guilty of the crime until he mentions or expresses the name before them. Jesus didn't do that. For Jesus to claim that he was the Messiah was not blasphemy under Jewish law, nor was it blasphemy to claim that he was the Son of God, for every son of Israel was sometimes called a son of God. And the term at that time had too many meanings to be a, make you uh, criminally liable. The Romans could not have crucified Jesus for the offense alleged. They would not have crucified him for any offense against the Jewish religion. Nor would they have delivered him over to the Jews for crucifixion had he been found guilty of a crime against Roman laws. The Romans would have gotten rid of him. But Pilate, the Roman ruler of the province, found Jesus innocent and so declared it in Luke 23 and 4. The civilization of Rome had reached its greatest peak at that time. The Romans had the best lawyers at that time and the greatest orators at that time. In the Roman courts at that time, a man was not condemned without a trial, according to the law, not executed without sufficient cause, duly presented and proven. We witness where the Romans got their laws from more than 2,000 years uh, before the dawn of Christianity, from Kemet, from Babylon, from Sumer, from Abyssinia. These ancient civilizations created the laws for the protection of its peoples, which was superior to anything we have here today. And the Romans learned all of that from the defeat of the masters. You. Let me finish up. Yet, the Bible scribes and, conveni and the conniving church fathers want you to believe that the highest Roman official of the land would outrage and disgrace all appearances of decency by condemning a man to death whom he had just in the same breath pronounced innocent. In all history, there is no more infamous and despicable illegal court proceedings and sentencing than was that ascribed to Pilate by John 19 and 6. It was the very height of Orwellian double-think, double-speak bullshit when the Bible says, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. What? Now, according to the John narrative, it was not the Jews but the Romans who crucified Jesus. Pilate scourged him in 19 and 1. The soldiers... Uh, Platted him a crown of thorns and put it on his head, 19 and 2. Pilate wrote the inscription, eye on our eye, on the cross, 19 and 19. The soldiers crucified him and cast lots for his clothing, 19 and 23. One of the soldiers thrust a spear in his side, 19 and 34. And Pilate disposed of the body, 19 and 38. But under Roman law, no accusation of heresy, blasphemy, or false assumption of a prophet, or any claim to divinity was a defense. The red, the lie, you can read this in the life of Christ. Page 284. Um, I want to put this down real quick first, and then we're going to go to break. Under Roman law, he says, no Roman citizen could be crucified. Listen to this carefully. No, no Roman citizen could be crucified, not even freeborn persons, except one who is of the lowest repute or who is a basis of all criminals. Punishment by crucifixion was reserved only for slaves and the worst of criminals. There was a law that existed in Rome at that time called just civitatis. 
Listen to me. Just J E S civitatis. C I V I T A T I S. This law was declared to be the privilege of every Roman. It stated that no Roman citizen or freeborn was ever to be crucified. So it would be both illegal and unprecedented to deliver such a man as Jesus to a cross or deliver anyone to it for such a trivial offense as was charged against him. Another point, crucifixion was not a form of Jewish punishment. It was unknown amongst the ancient Jews. The author of the work known as, uh, known as Rabbi Yeshua states that there were only four capital punishments recognized by Jewish law. Stoning, burning, beheading, and strangling. It was also illegal to have, compi to co to have, to have um, compelled Simon to carry Jesus' cross in Matthew 27 and 12, 32, and Mark 15 and 21, Luke 23 and 26. He just happened by the way, but John knows nothing about this and says in 1917 that Jesus carried the damn cross himself. Now, what I want to do is to break for a moment and I'm going to come back to the finishing portion and what we're going to do is get into another portion of um, false foundations for the church we're going to get into what is known as the dark or middle ages during the times of the inquisition this is how your Christianity spread and at this point I will also be giving you different signs and symbols of the Illuminati for you to look out for so that you could know how they are playing the sigils under your, uh, under, your, under your thing in the forms of commercials and in symbologies around um, uh, your civilization. So take a break at this point. There's so much to say. Usually when I do do my lectures, you know, I usually take at least, what, it's eight hours, nine hours. <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, I have that much time. And so what I'm going to do is based on all that I have accumulated here, I'm going to um, jump, put one more or two logical things for you to think about referring to the so-called crucifixion of Jesus and uh, <clears throat> bring us full swing and full tit to the present. Uh, we were, we left off someplace when they were, we had just killed him or we were dealing with the laws. Uh, I'm going to probably have, hmm? Yeah, the laws of execution. And uh, I see that we will need some time for questions and answers. But what I'm going to do, and I had promised everyone that I would be putting down facts uh, so that it can be either disputed argued over, uh, you know, agreed to, whatever. Um, I wanted this tape to be chock full of information that is based on scholarship uh, rather than just us having conversations about uh, our, our theories and so forth. We already know that. Uh, this tape, there, none of my tapes, I guess, were sufficient enough for people to say, well, this is based on scholarship. You see, uh, a lot of times people's truths are not in sync. They cannot, they cannot interface with common sense. They are too busy um, living a life of instructions. And people need instructions. They have this thing where they got to have a calendar and everything broken down for them. So to those people, I found it necessary so to lend an air of credibility to myself to let you know that I do my research. I don't just sit around telling you stories and myths. I have come to my conclusions based upon years of research into different uh, categories of knowledge. I studied a lot of things, a, li a little bit about a lot of things, and a lot of things about a few. Okay? So I'm going to jump a few, and for instance, let's take us back to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane, what is there that was so uh, specific about the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, everyone was asleep in the garden of Gethsemane. Yes or no? Yes. All right. Now, three times did Jesus allegedly pray to the Father in Matthew 26, 39 to 45. And each time he asked them to join him. But each time he returned, they were all asleep. So, how in the hell did anybody know what went on? Who 
who was there documenting what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? Okay? This is exactly like the prophet scribe who wrote the Genesis account. He actually had the nerve to write, and God said. Like it was there at the beginning of creation with God and heard God said what he said. So you're getting to imagine now that the people who are documenting about the history of your God, you Christians, obviously somebody was there in the garden, like, you know, Spielberg directing. <laughs> Nobody saw nothing, but we got the whole account of what happened. Common sense again is suspended because belief is adhered to. Belief is what is promoted. It's stupid, or better yet, if you use your intelligence, like most Christians don't, you'd see that it is all false. A narrative using myth to teach a spiritual lesson. That's all it is. Now, regarding the existence of the Jesus of the Gospels, uh, I have a ton more information. Um, I don't want to get too tough into all of it here, but I do want to start speaking about um, how Jesus being the greatest teacher ever known, and the only time you know about him was when he was 33, 12, and dead. <laughs> all right? Those are the only times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading off some information into the record um, by an author that I feel writes with my style. I feel his flow. I understand what he's talking about. Um, so instead of me just trying to parrot it by bringing information to my head to tell you information, he has eloquently put it down in a book called um, Misconceptions and Myths of the Bible by Graham. Okay? That is an excellent book for Christians because I believe Christians... Uh, if they do have the courage to read outside of the purview of their little cloistered book called the Bible, they will find a whole treasure of information. A treasure of information. I'm talking about the kind of treasure that, did you see the mummy? Yes. Remember when them boys, they stood up there and looked out when they turned on the lights on that? That's the treasure. That's just part of the treasure you're going to get if you just come out of this Christian nonsense of belief. Now follow me, and I'm going to speak as clearly as possible, prayerfully. I will read um, for your understanding. The Catholic Church asserts it was founded by Christ and on the Gospel, Peter. Well, let's just see what this claim amounts to. In John, I guess 15, So when they had denied, when they had dined, Jesus said unto Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Loveth me not more than else? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. This is in John 2. As already explained, Peter is the earth. Peter is not a person. Peter is a principle. And this, is, this it is that must feed the lambs, the life upon it. As the statement is repeated three times, it implies the three biologic kingdoms. The text then is nothing to do with the Catholic Church, save to refute it. As Jonah is purely mythological, calling Peter his son makes Peter also mythological. Today intelligent people do not swallow, uh, do not swallow Jonah, yet they do swallow this similitude. There are people who actually said that they believe so strongly in the Bible that if it was Jonah that swallowed the whale, they'd have believed it. In John 32 it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have thee, that he may sift ye as wheat. In 32, But I prayed for thee, for thy faith failed not, and, that, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. In Luke 22. Now this text has something to do with the Catholic Church. Its close identification of Peter with Satan is very revealing to those who understand occult literature. But, of this more in my moment. Now, the next text of 18 and 19 should suffice. In 18, And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give thee unto, unto thee the, key, the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whosoever 
shalt thou bind on earth, be bound in heaven, and whosoever shall be loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is what the Catholic Church uh, has used to found Peter as the head of his church. But four verses later, Jesus calls Peter Satan. Here we go. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Thus, if the Catholic Church is founded by Peter, it is founded on Satan, as I said. A fact we have long suspected. Satan simply means matter. And so does Peter the rock. Therefore, the two are one. Peter is but the New Testament Esau who founded, or was rather founded a city called Petra, the rock, also Edom, or Atom, the earth. This it is that binds and looses according to its laws, St. Peter's keys. And what it binds and looses is the, is the, the seven life principles. The seven churches of Revelation are an outline of this. This binding and loosing, Peter, is also the testament of Pharaoh. He too bound and loosed the life force Moses. Warfare with him represents this. And Paul's quarrel with Peter during the Bible times is the same meaning cosmologically. As this binding and loosing is of nature, that of the church is utterly false and pretentious. And this includes the blessings and cursings, its excommunications, so dreaded by its people. No moral or spiritual effect whatsoever. Its results are political and social only, and so but another means of power. And also it was with Peter. We need to understand the church. Jesus was not speaking of an institution that we call the church, Catholic or otherwise. In fact, there was no such word or institution in his time. The original was the word el ecclesis or ecclesis or ecclesis, e c c l e s i e, and it meant only a gathering, an assembly, no pope, priest, or hierarchy. Now to understand this gathering or assembly, we must remember the position of the Creator when these alleged words were spoken. It was immediately before the transfiguration, the invisible elements made visible. The ecclesia was therefore the gathering or assembling from space of the planetary elements into the sun, Hades. The choosing of this personal, of its, person, of its personnel is therefore but the New Testament parallel of the Old Testament's chosen people. So likewise is the rock on which it is founded. The precedent, the precedent for this is the rock or stone that grew in Nebuchadnezzar's dream until it, was fill, until it filled the whole entity. This is the earth itself. Here we see why the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why should they, since this hell or Hades created it? After its creation, the elements were again gathered and assembled in evolution. And the ecclesies, here is the organic life forms, the life force with which it had to be under the end of the world. Thus the church founded on Peter the rock is but the earth and its biological life forms. This is the only Catholic or, or universal church there is, that is nature. It is the human institution. It, if the human institution was meant, why did it become divided instead of assembled into the 70 different odd sects of Christianity? If Christ chose Peter to head his institution, why did the apostles ignore his wish and elect James the just instead? He, not Peter, was the first pope. Later, he was deposed and stoned to death. And Aeneas, who deposed him, was also deposed. Does this sound like divine selection to you? If then the leaders were ignorant and credulous, as were the original peoples. Now check this out. This is deep. The New Testament, all this has forgotten now. We're taught that Christianity was a new revelation of truth and its founders enlightened men and saints. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Ignorance is the soil in which religions grow and Christianity is no exception. The New Testament itself calls the disciples unlearned and ignorant men and the Jewish judges before whom their converts were brought pronounced them as idiots or idioti from which we get the word idiots. Still later they were called fools in Christ the Samaritan doctor called them Tartax, T Thartax, T H A R T A C S, at their period, in the reign of Thartak. Thartak was a comedic god of credulity and vulgar faith. He was portrayed as a man with a book, a cloak, 
and the head of an ass. He appears in the Old Testament as Tartak, one of the foreign gods that Solomon worshipped. If then the leaders of, the, of Christianity were ignorant and credulous, what are the masses that follow them? According to Leakey, they were, in all intellectual virtues, lower than any other period in history of mankind. They were made up mostly of the poor and the obscure, who were drawn into embrace the Gospels by an inner need, and whose low position on the social scale was a standing ground of reproach against the new religion from the side of its adversaries. It is only the religion of simpletons, the ignoble, the senseless, the slaves, and the women folk and children whom they wish to persuade to join their congregation or to, dis or to persuade. This is what Celsus said. Celsus said, the rude and the menial masses who had hitherto been uh, almost beneath the notice of the Greek and the Roman culture flocked into Christianity. Okay, And Hodges on Celsus said, He disliked them for their poverty and ignorance. They seemed to be presumptuous and impertinent people who, understood, who undertook to be the teachers, having never learned. <laughs> I will not sit in the seat of, of synods while geese and cranes confusedly wrangle, St. Gregory's, Gregory said. The many had begun to play with psychic and spiritual forces let loose from the mysteries, and the many went mad for a time and have not yet regained their senses. They had a full share of tumult, anarchy, injustice, and war. The primitive Christians were men whose ardor was fierce in proportion to their ignorance. These are all the people talking about who the Christians were back then. All this the apologists smothered in lies, and now our deluded preachers, teachers, playwrights, and scenarists paint these early Christians as the inspired few, fighting and dying for some true faith, a brand, uh, the, and brand the really inspired um, so-called pagans as ignoramuses. Tacitus calls um, Christianity pernicious superstition. The new faith is a perverse and extravagant superstition. This is what Pliny the Elder had said. A superstition vain and fanatic, said Suetonius. Today, a still deluded race looks upon these statements as pagan opposition to the light of the world, where they were just but deluded uh, people uh, of, the, of, of our spiritual understandings. Thus, what the church, whatever the early Christians suffered, it was not as the church asserts, because of the new gospel they preach, but because of the old absurdity they resurrected. Belief in literal mythology. Okay, this is why the Christians were persecuted, because they were believing in literal mythology. Another son of God, number 16, had appeared miraculously, conceived of the virgin born, a third part of the Trinity walked about in Galilee. This was that blasphemy barbarously told. Porphyry had denounced yet a band of fanatics called the Christians, was actually demanding the restoration of this old religion, or this old myth fable. In other words, all of the, 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 the Greek myths, all of the old um, uh, Persian myths, they wanted to literalize it and say that God did walk the earth. And the people were telling them, listen, it's crazy. All the wisdom knowledge of the ages was burnt in the Marcus place, in the light of the world, and triumphanted, and the light of the world of reason, ah, all of, let me get this right, all of the wisdom knowledge of the ages was burnt in the marketplace. The light of the world had triumphed and the light of reason had died. That's sweet. I like that. Now, they all tell you that Nero burnt Rome, right? No, he didn't. That was a big lie. What happened was the Christians began setting fire to all the old information. All of the old libraries, all of the old places where they had their all of their all of their rivals, who were down on Christianity, the Christians began to grow in power, and they began setting these small fires as a form of protest. Now Nero, as crazy and as sick as all the line was, Nero used to hold these particular events where even the criminals were protected. It was, there was no death sentence on the Nero. This is historically facted. All right? You had life imprisonment, or if you were crucified, you had to have done really something stupid. But Nero was built up by the Christians as being this heinous person who tortured Christians, and it never happened. It was the Christians who were the ones who trashed Nero. And it was the Christians who burnt the churches of all of their uh, adversaries. 
And then that's what happened with... Um, Okay, let's just get to this. The destruction of all the evidence of Christianity's Gnostic and pagan source was really the first work of the church. It was the evangelists themselves who started it in Antioch, as, the, as stated in, in Acts. Speaking, just, speaking of just such things, the Emperor Julian said he would deal with them more at length when we begin to explore the monstrous deeds and fraudulent machinations of the evangelists. And their followers, Edward Carpenter, wrote this. They took special pains to destroy the pagan records and so obliterate the evidence of their own dishonesty. By order of the church, all the books of the Gnostic Basilides were burned. Likewise, Porphyry's 36 volumes were burned. Pope Gregory VII burned the Apollo Library filled with ancient law. Emperor Theodosius had 27,000 schools of the mysteries of the mysteries papyrus rolls burned because they contained the doctrinal basis of the gospels by offering rich rewards Ptolemy Philadelphus gathered 270,000 ancient documents these two were burnt for the same reason as someone has said the early Christians heated their baths with the ancient wisdom and that knowledge they may have contained and what knowledge they may have contained nor did the destruction end with the founders of Christianity. The fanatics they made carried on their work. The Crusades burnt all the books they could find, including original Hebrew scrolls, Kemetic scrolls, and the like. In 1233, the works of Maimonides were burned along with 12,000 volumes of the Talmud. In 1244, 18,000 books of various kinds were destroyed. According to Draper, Cardinal Zemes, X-I-M-E-N-E-S, Zeminis, delivered to the flames in the square of Grenada 80,000 Arabic manuscripts. On finding similar law in the New World, the Spanish Christians destroyed it and the temples that contained it. All evidence of source destroyed, the Christian fathers could now substitute their own stupidity and absurdities. And to substantiate them, they altered words and inserted verses that did not exist in the original texts. Celsus, a witness to this falsification, said of the revisionists, some of them, as it were in a drunken state producing self-induced illusions, remodeled their gospel from its first written form and reform it so that they may be able to refute the objections brought against it. On the same subject, Gerald Massey wrote, they made dumb all pagan testimony against the unparalleled imposture then being perfected in Rome. They had almost reduced the first four centuries to silence on all the matters of the most vital importance for any proper understanding of the true religion of the Christian superstition. The mythos having been at, at last published as a human history, everything else was suppressed or forced to support the fraud. It is well known the Christian fathers were notorious forgers. Even the Catholics themselves admit that. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, quote, in all these departments, forgery and interpolation was well, as well as ignorance had wrought mischief on a grand scale. This is the Catholics who are the original Christians saying this. Indeed, Pope Stephen II went so far as to write a letter and sign St. Peter's name to it. When we know, <laughs> check it. When we know that, that Peter never existed, these deceptions take on a new meaning. They give the key to the church, entire history, motive, and they give us the keys to it. And the whole motive and purpose, dom domination, wealth, and power. To this end, all else was done, including the fakeries, forgeries, and the burning of books. In spite of all this, we are told the founders of our faith were good men, filled with the Holy Spirit, and therefore above all crime and cruelty of common day. Such is the teaching, yet their own words belie these lies. Consider this from Jerome, one of the original Christian fathers, for instance. If thy father lies down across thy threshold, if thy mother uncovers to thine eyes the bosom that suckled thee, trample on your father's lifeless body, trample on your mother's bosom, and with eyes unmoistened and dry, fly to the Lord that calleth thee. This is the Christian zeal, 
and the very opposite of religion. And Tertullian, who was a black man, gloating on the prospects of seeing the philosophers in hell and chanted, say, how I shall laugh, how shall I rejoice, how shall I triumph when I see so many these illustrious kings who were said to have mounted into heaven, groaning with Jupiter their God in the lowest depths of hell. And St. Augustine, another Negro on his religion, stated, The enemies thereof I hate vehemently. Oh, that thou wilt slay them with thy two-edged sword. And who were these enemies? Atheists, infidels, destroyers of the truth? No, indeed, the keepers of the truth. Those anonymous Gnosticans, those abhorrent Gnostics. Here we shall recall the, the words of Franz Sweeney. It may truly be said that the darkest and bloodiest records in history can show us, that, that history can show us are the attacks on Orthodox Church, of, of the Orthodox Church upon the Gnostic mystics. Oh yes, it takes more than ignorance to found a religion. It takes dishonesty, cruelty, and war as well. That Christianity had such a beginning may seem to be faithful, um, may seem to the faithful quite incredible, but if so, it is only because the little that they know about it came from priestly apologists lying for the same reasons as their predecessors. The unbelieving should read contemporary historians, Eusebius for instance, in 250 AD, that, that AD means after the delusion. <laughs> He left a record of the church at that time and it reads like this. And this is Eusebius of Caesarea. He was there at the council of Nicaea. He was there putting all the dirt down. And he says, But since from our great freedom we have fallen into neglect and sloth, when each had begun to envy and slander the other, when we waged intestine war against the other, wounding each other with words as with sword and spears, when leaders assailed leaders and people assailed people, hurling epithets at each other, when fraud, when fraudulent hypocrisy had reached the highest heights of malice, when devoid of all sense, we gave no thought to the worship of God, but believing like certain impious men that human affairs are controlled by no providence, we heaped crime upon crime, when our pastors, despising the rule of religion, fought with each other intent on nothing but abuse, threats, jealousy, hatred, and mutual enmity, each claiming for himself a principality as a sort of tyranny. And we are asked to believe that these men were guided and inspired by the Holy Ghost. Now I want to read this to you. To cite only a few of these Christians, here are what the Christians... Now you're supposed to be under the whole body of Christ. This is what these Christians who are vying for power broke themselves down into. These were the different sects, S-E-C-T-S. -E the Arians, A-R-I-A-N-S. The Nestorians. The, Marti the Martionets. The Marionettes. The Marionites. The Jacobites. The, Basilid the, Bas the Basilidians. The, the Carpo... Criti the the Carpocratians, the Calridians, the Utrician, the Utriscians, the Utrexians, the Sibylians, the Valentinians, the Gnostics, the Ebonites, and later the Jesuits. Each of these had their own interpretation of the scriptures, and the form that came down to us today is based on the one that won the war over all the others. That's all it was. Another fallacy perpetrated by the church concerns its creeds, dogmas, rites, and rituals. The gullible people are led to believe these all derive from God or Christ, the apostles and the scriptures. They should read their own Bishop Hillary. He told them where it came from. Quote, it is a thing equally deplorable and dangerous that there are as many doctrines and inclinations and as many sources of blasphemy as there are faults among us. Because we make creeds arbitrarily and explain them as arbitrarily. Each year, nay, every moon, we make new creeds to describe invisible mysteries. We repent of what we have done. We defend those we re who repent. We anathemize those whom we defend. We condemn either the doctrines of our others in ourselves or of our own that are of others. 
and reciprocally tear each other to pieces, we have been the cause of each other's ruin. Here we have the source of our sacred doctrines. Where are they now? Where they are now, the work of ignorance guiding. No, 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 I'm going to tell you. I'm just get to the point. Okay. This is the juicy stuff. Concerning the earth's motion. Now this is what Christianity did to science after they burned all these hundreds of thousands of manuscripts. Concerning the motion of the earth, this is what your St. Augustine, O Christian father, said. He said, it is impossible that there should be inhabitants on the opposite side of the earth, since no such race is recorded by scripture among the descendants of Adam. And Father Inuka, the opinion of the earth's motion is of all heresies the most abominable, the most pernicious and the most scandalous. The immobility of the earth is thrice sacred and Langtentius concluded, it is impossible that men can be so absurd as to believe that the crops and trees on the other side of the earth are hanging downward and that our men have their head higher than their, that their feet have their, have their feet higher than their heads. How can anybody look up at the moon, the full moon, and think the earth is flat? Think about that. <laughs> it's whoo. Must have been something in the water. Oh. Really? <laughs> I want to read something to you, all you good Catholics. All right, now this is deep because this is what they break their um, Christianity is. No. This is called the Athanasian Creed, A-T-H-A-N-A-S-I-A-N. And the Athanasian Creed is as follows. One. Whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Two, which faith except everyone do deep, whole, and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. Three, and the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. Four, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. Five, for there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. There's no women involved. Six, but the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. They aren't even coexistent in one body. Such as the Father is, such as the Son, and such as the Holy Ghost. The Father uncreate, the Son uncreate, and the Holy Ghost uncreate. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, the Holy Ghost incomprehensible. And under such a creed, everything else becomes incomprehensible. <laughs> now we get to the juicy part, because we're going to drop on this where your Christianity came from. And I want to drop what was done back in the time where we mentioned St. Jerome. Listen to this. It was the practice of the monks either to cut or shave their hair. They wrapped their head in towels to escape the sight of the profane. Their legs and feet were naked except in the extreme cold of winter. And their slow and feeble steps were supported by a long staff. The aspect of a genuine anachorat was horrid and disgusting. Every sensation that is offensive to man was thought acceptable to God. And the angelic rule of Turbane condemned the salutary custom of bathing the limbs in water and of anointing them with oil. Athanasius, in his life of Anthony of Thebes, an illiterate youth who became founder of one of the 
the anchorite sex, remarks with approval that Anthony had a holy horror of clean water. And his feet in particular were never contaminated by it. St. Benedict, one of the greatest administrators of the early church, pronounced solemnly that those that are well, and especially to the young, bathing shall seldom be permitted. And his followers accepted the prohibitions with great zeal. St. Agnes, they have, I remember pictures, I remember statues of St. Agnes in the Catholic Church when I was a Catholic. Oh, you didn't know that. I was there. I flew over the cuckoo's nest. You can do it too. St. Agnes was never washed throughout her lifetime. But the fact that the lifetime was only 13 years may have had something to do with it. And a 4th century pilgrim to Jerusalem boasted that she had not washed her face for 18 years so as not to disturb the holy water that she used in her baptism. St. Jerome criticized some of his followers for, keep, for keeping too clean. Oh, it gets better. Oh, it gets better. These are where your Christians came from. This is who you are following. These are your fathers. These are your mothers. All right? St. Jerome criticized some of his followers for following, for, for, for keeping too clean. Many of the ascetics went further than simple neglect of their own bodies and sought out lepers suffering from ulcers and other people with the more disgusting and filthy diseases so as to give the ascetic the chance to wash ulcerated feet with their own hair in the style of St. Mary Magdalene, to kiss leprous or cancerous and ulcerated skin and generally wallow in the perverse delights of cropophilia. It is a pity that they did not try, while they were giving themselves such strange enjoyment, to use any practical means of relieving the suffering of the patients that they were groveling around with. St. Hugh of Lincoln used to gather together a great assembly of male lepers and then kiss them, reserving his fondest and closest embraces for those who were the most deformed and taking care to kiss the actual ulcers of their skin. Oh yeah, this is good. This, this is something, this is an appetite teaser. Yeah. Make you want to run out and go eat something. Wait now, let me, let me get this. Let me get this. Fortunately, the church can always find unassailable arguments for any policy that seems to be expedient. The Old Testament was forgotten and the New Testament provided the answer. Christ himself had eaten at the house of Simon the leper and had cured the leper in a certain city. Obviously, leprosy was not a punishment for sin, but a mark of divine grace. These people were their minds. Even more ingenious, listen, even more ingenuous commentators deduced from the passage in Isaiah were langurs, uh, verve langores nostros ipse tulit, et doloros nostros ipse porivat et reputiv reputavinus ium quasium leporis, uh, leprosum and he all said which had up to been just that uh, Christ was a leper treat him like that and you're all right leprosy suddenly became leprosy suddenly became respectable and many of the faithful set up leper hospitals to care for the unfortunate bearers of the divine stigma the first English hospital was in Nottingham England and they soon sprang up all over Leper houses, or what they call Lazar houses, Lazarus houses, became the fashionable way of purchasing one's way into heaven. Set up a leper house, and you're going to heaven. <laughs> now, wait a minute, I'm going to get uh, some of the other good uh, two to four times a year set it to its uh, Ah, here we go. <laughs> All right. Check this out. <clears throat> Plague is carried by fleas, which in their turn are passengers on rats and rodents. Okay? This is fun. Now, the flea mostly concerned is labored by many of us in Central Asia. They blame everything coming from Asia. Okay? 
Fleas were so common that they were regarded almost affectionately as a constant companion to man. Certainly fleas and lice, if not man's best friend, might be considered his closest friend. And those who were lucky enough to have the best and the warmest clothes often had the most fleas. Ah, when Thomas a Becket was disrobed for burial after his assassination, check this, y'all. Y'all like Thomas a Becket? How'd y'all like Richard Burton as Thomas a Becket? Now when these people show these pristine, clean, shiny floors to the palaces, that's the biggest lie on the planet. When they show you these beautiful looking people, all the women looking so clean, and the, there was some stink fucks, I'm telling you. <laughs> these people were filthy. They walked in mud. They were so I mean, they were the most disgusting and vile of people. I don't give a damn how they want to flavor it in Hollywood, how the British want to try to sanitize their past, how the Europeans want to sanitize their history. They were some stink-ass people before the Moors came and taught them how to bathe, gave them underwear, showed them sanitary conditions, everything. Now, I don't give a damn what you think. You can call me racist. This is your history. And I'm just sick and tired of you giving me this Hollywood goddamn version with Elizabeth Taylor and all of these people fanning themselves. Y'all was some stink. Let me tell you something. That's where perfume came from. You needed the perfume in the handkerchief so that you could wave it back and forth because the stink and the funk coming from the next motherfucker was too overwhelming. The powdered wigs you saw sticking up on your head, that shit was a beehive of lice. Y'all were some nasty motherfuckers, and don't tell me no shit about no, all this crap about how wonderful and how civilizing you came up. Y'all were nasty. Queen Anne had a party because she had her first bath on her 23rd birthday. So don't talk no shit to me about your civilizing. Now, when Thomas a Becket was disrobed for burial after his assassination, a large population of disciples were evicted. The dead archbishop was clothed in an extraordinary accumulation of garments. Now y'all listen carefully. Outermost there was a brown mantle. Next, a white sur uh, surplice. Under this, a fur coat. This man wore a fur coat <laughs> under a white shirt. <laughs> this shit is hilarious. <laughs> Out of Moses Bank. White sir, under this, a fur coat of lamb's wool with a woolen pelisse. Pe pelisse. Then another woolen pelisse. Below this, the black cowled robe of the Benedictine order. Then a shirt. And finally, next to his body, a tight fitting suit of coarse hair cloth covered on the outside with linen. The first of its kind seen in England. Now check this. The innumerable vermin which had infested the dead prelate were stimulated to such activity by the cold air that his hair cloth, in the words of the chronicler who was there, boiled over with them like water in a simmering cauldron. Friar Alberto, in the second tale of the fourth day of the, of the de, uh, Decameron, sums up the ecclesiastical attitude of warm clothing. I will do something today that I will have not done in a long time. I shall undress myself. <laughs> now, could you imagine, you sitting there over this man's body, you cut open his clothes, his five to six to eight layers of clothes that he ain't never took off in his life. <laughs> and they called Egypt the dark, right? And they called Africa the dark continent. The Chemites bathed three and four times a day. Understand this. But this man had so many fleas that he looked like a bubbling cauldron. Could you imagine how far they leap back? Whoa! I mean, it had to at least be, for it to bubble, it had to be at least two or three layers thick of these vermin. Because they're trying to scramble each other. It's cold. And they're trying to find a way to get back. Oh! Oh! Whoo! Damn! I, t 
shit. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Wait, now here we go, people. Here's where medicine came into fruition. Because you got to remember that since the church burnt all the wisdom, these people had a little bit of their superstition. They was doing everything they could. Now, medicine was no better. Now, listen up, listen up. The cures and prophylactics were based on fantastic flights of imagination and minimal practical experience, like much of the psychoanalytic writing. Paracelsus, you heard of him, right? Yeah, he was called Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. They had to call that both. <laughs> now, they say that Paracelsus was the father of quackery. All right? Now, he reported on the use of the, for the plague people of dried toads to relieve the pain of the boobers. The boobers are actually the boils. That's where the word bubonic plague came from. Okay? So, this father of uh, medical quackery reported on the widespread use of dried toads to relieve the pain of the boobers, explaining that as a live toad is moist and slimy, so a dead toad or dead tried toad will absorb any moist or slimy material from the body. When it is full, it should be thrown away and a new toad applied. No one should feel disgust at such a physic. In such a time of trouble, no one could afford to be disgusted at even more, uh, at even, at ever more repulsive practices. On an obscure reasoning that evil can drive out evil, the boils of dead plague victims were cut out and dried and administered to the sick as a remedy. In East Prussia, the prelings, or the preklings from the, the pricklings from the boils were given to the health, to the healthy in milk as a prophylactic. Wait, check it out. The belief that one poison would drive out another induced many people, particularly the poor who could not afford doctor bills, to spoon the pus out of the bulbas of the dying and the dead and to swallow it. Saint Cat... <laughs> I thought it would get nice and juicy. Wait a minute. Saint Catherine of Siena is renowned... Listen to this. Saint Catherine of Siena... This is saint. These are the names. Saint. These are your saints. <laughs> St. Catherine of Siena is renowned for having subjugated the body by drinking a bowl of pus. But it may have been merely a mundane precaution against plague infection. She gathered around as much of a bowl of pus to drink. England had its share of all these magical and pseudo-medical practices. And one can imagine how each new cure reported from the European countries found an eager audience as news of the pestilence came ever and ever to closer quarters. But all the efforts were in vain. While the Black Death, and I like the, like the way they call it, they used to be called the Blue Death because on these Caucasian skin, before it began coming up, the, all these spots were blue. Okay? It was called La Morte Bleue in France. The Blue Death. But then it became the Black Death. Hmm. Okay. When the Black Death struck, it carried away whole families, whole districts in three or four days. Baker's, Baker's figures of nine-tenths of the England English population carried off is a serious overestimate, but in some cities the proportion approached this level. In Bristol, for instance, it was said that only one-tenth of the citizens were left alive by 1349. <laughs> uh. Check this out. The death toll in the church was catastrophic. Reasonable, reliable figures were drawn up the deaths of the priesthood. Oh, not enough of them died, though. Because most of the records of appointments to parishes still exist. About 25,000 priests died in England alone. And in one parish of, Sa uh, of Shaftesbury, or Shaftesbury, there is a chilling reminder of the speed with which the plague struck. New vicars were appointed on November 29th, December 10th, January 6th, and May 12th, all owing to death of the incumbent. 
the, the Bishop of Bath and Wells, Ralph of Shrewsbury, writing from the relative safety of his country home, was forced to sanction emergency measures that would have scandalized St. Paul himself when he wrote this underlying message to the priests. At once and publicly instruct and induce yourselves or by any other, all who are sick of the present malady or who shall be taken ill, that in articulo mortis, if they are not able to obtain a priest, they should make their confessions of their sins, even to a layman, and if not the man at hand, then tell it to a woman. <laughs> As the sick began to outnumber the well, the dead bodies became too numerous to dispose of, and with any traditional decencies. The funeral services and the burials degenerated into a hasty shoveling into plague pits at the outskirts of each town. Grave diggers and carters to carry the corpses could only be recruited from the class with nothing to lose, criminals, vagabonds, and beggars, and they made the best use of their opportunities to rob not only the corpses, but any houses into which the sicknesses had been penetrated, knowing well that no neighbors or officials would dare to enter the house to interfere. These ghouls soon became almost as much an object of fear as the plague itself. They were repudiated in particular to rape any moderately attractive females in the stricken houses, whether alive, dying, or already dead. <laughs> this, this is Christendom. Yeah, they still do it in the hospitals. Check this out. Many people fumigated their houses or kept enormous fires burning to drive the plague away. They burnt incense, juniper, laurel leaves, cypress, pine, balm, rosemary, lavender, anything to cover up the dreadful stench of the streets. Plague waters were invented at various times to pour on handkerchiefs or into pom uh, pomanders, traditionally a dried orange filled with the fragrant oils for those who would have to venture out. The original Eau de la Cologne Eau de Calon was in fact invented as a specific against the plague and uses a large proportion of oil of rosemary and similar herbal oils with a reputation for healing or um, prophylaxis. On the other hand, with the curious double think that inflicts a community faced with a crushing disaster, it was also believed that other foul smells would keep away the plague and its attendant reek and many householders spent their time couched gross, grotesquely over their own toilets inhaling the fumes. <laughs> Y'all get that picture! <laughs> Y'all get the picture! You take a dump and then you get over it. <laughs> And then you go, you know. <laughs> that was like aromatherapy against the plague, right? <laughs> Woo! Oh. oh my God. No wonder we don't get European history the way it's supposed to be told. Woo -wee. Oh. Okay. Final before we get to the, the last end. Human and animal dung and household rubbish all discharged into the streets and left to find their own way to the rivers of their own town. Now you got to remember that most of the filth was going into the very water they were drinking. All discharged into the streets, which was supplemented by byproducts of slaughtering and butchering. Many cattle were slaughtered in the St. Nicholas Shambles in Seacole Lane. The meat that was not sold immediately would be preserved with coarse salt or powdered beef because of the grains of salt, that's why they call it powdered beef, just as corned beef is called after corn-like grains of the curing salt and packed into tubes. St. Nicholas, after whom several slaughterhouses and shambles were named, was famous for having revived children who had been killed and salted down in the time of famine. They were eating the children. After the meat had been prepared and sold, yeah, that's St. Nick, you're right. Santa Claus, old St. Nick. He was a cannibal. Pigs were killed, in, and check it out, they got it. Fleet Street is where 
now Farrington Street was, waited for the rain to wash the rubbish into the water. Pigs were killed on Rother Street, otherwise known as Red Rose Street, and it was the last rechristened Put Pudding Lane in modern title because of the kids' puddings or entrails were flung into it to make their way slowly down the Thames into the bottom of the hill. If conditions in the town streets were bad, conditions in the houses were little better. In the, very, in the country, the poor lived in tent-shaped huts made of wood and wattle around wooden posts, and the slightly better off lived in wooden houses with two or three rooms. In either case, if the family owned animals, they shared the accommodation. The anonymous author of uh, Gamma Girton's Needle has a great deal of robust fun when his characters are, talk are raking in the rubbish on the floor from the grandma's coddle to find a lost needle. Instead of finding it, they pick up droppings from the chickens and the cats, a theatrical device that seems to have fallen out of use. As the old lady also has the swill bucket in the room, the atmosphere can be imagined. Remember now, the swill bucket was also used uh, for the beer because remember, hen shit used to get into the beer. And since it causes fermentation real quick, it gives you that head. That's where the head comes from, from the ale. Now they do it with other chemical rings, but they used to, uh, the, the, the chickens used to live on top of the cross where they used to get their beer drawn from. And the chickens shit in the beer. <laughs> That's what gave the head. <laughs> so uh, all you beer drinkers out there, <laughs> think about the ritual when you all are doing it. Now before we go to... <laughs> Uh, from Hulton Hotema's book, Genes The Genesis of Christianity. Judge T.L. Strain in 1875 said in a book called The Christian Evidence, he said, Never was there a creed that made greater demands upon the credulity of mankind or offered under circumstances more fraught with, with consequences to the interest of those to whom it is addressed. At the same time, never has the array of facts, taking them as stated, upon which the integrity of the creeds depends, been presented to the consideration of mankind upon grounds less capable of standing the test of examination and less entitling as to what is asserted to common belief, to command belief. And I'm telling you, this goes on. There are hundreds, hundreds of authors. Now, in my final because I could have gone on for another three or four hours. I'm going to break down Christianity through the Inquisition to give you an idea of what went on to spread the faith. And remember, we're not spreading the faith based upon us going along and piously talking to you. We are spreading the faith through fear, torture, murder, genocide, and the like. The middle of the Dark Ages. And now that Christianity is firmly established, what do we find? The kingdom of heaven on earth? No, on the contrary, a moral and intellectual degradation unparalleled in human history. According to Leakey, the two centuries after Constantine are uniformly represented by the fathers as periods of general and scandalous vice. And the following two are no better. Bishop Gregory of Tours wrote an account of them, and it is one of the darkest pictures in all history. On reading it, Gibbon remarked, it would be difficult to find anywhere more vice and less virtue. As of the 5th century, Salvenius, a priestly historian, had this to say, besides a very few who avoid evil, what is almost the whole body of Christians but a sink of iniquity? How many in the church will you find that are not drunkards or adulterers or fornicators or gamblers, or robbers, or murderers, or all together. And we are told Christianity uplifted the race, rid the world of pagan sin, and paved the way for true civilization. This too is Catholic scholarship. According to this, the saved and sanctified Christians were not responsible for those wretched conditions. They were the result of the invasion of the barbarians and their destruction of the Roman Empire. 